Um, well, it's never re too redundant to say um, welcome and welcome all of you to um, the symposium in this beautiful day. And I'd like to especially um, welcome and thank 10 speakers who come from Rome, um, Ann Arbor, uh, Hong Kong, Bangkok, right? Uh, Amsterdam, um, do I miss somebody? Seoul, um, and also New York, yes. So in the last um, a few months, we have exchanged emails and messages and texts uh, intensively and preparing for this symposium. So it's really like surreal to see all of you actually in one room. Um, um, so it, this symposium is in tandem with the um, exhibition we had at the Times um, Art Center curated by uh, Nikita and uh, Wang Xiaoyu. Um, it's, um, I highly recommend you go to see the show and it traces, it kind of presents a polyphony of border crossing uh, storytellers, and um, uh, we are here also as a group of uh, storytellers, um, you know, crossing borders, and not only just the national borders, but also crossing the borders of academic disciplines, and also the borders of each other's comfort zones, like we come from a university, we come from curatorial world, and some of us are practicing artists. So it's really meaningful to congregate here to have this conversation, and this conversation sort of started already from the opening last night, and so we already, you know, continued that conversation this morning during the breakfast, and, um, and I'm sure they will carry um, after this uh, symposium ends. So I will just quickly um, introduce the uh, panels. Um, so we, um, we have two panels this, um, this afternoon. The panel one is the Inter-Asian Network, Connectivity and Circulation. So we will have uh, three speakers to sort of trace out the contours and complexities of uh, different kinds of Asian, inter-Asian networks and to look at some of the important, important no, uh, nodal points um, in these networks. And in the second um, panel, we'll look at uh, various forms of uh, artist collectivism and inter internationalism in complex um, geographical context. So um, the first speaker um, is Professor Ming Tianpo. And Ming has, do you have the, the, um, the, bio? the bio? I don't want to read the bio. Ming really has really impressive career. And if you really go through everything she did, it will take an hour. Uh, <laughs> at least. So I met Ming two, three years ago in Seoul at the um, uh, Tate Symposium. Um, and I was really impressed by her presentation, her comments, and, um, and just learned a lot from her. Uh, Ming is a professor of art history um, and the founding member of the Center for Transnational um, Cultural Analysis at Carleton University in Canada. And she's interested in transcultural models and histories that provide new structures for understanding and reconfiguring the global. Um, she has uh, published on Japanese modernism, global modernisms, plural, and the diaspora. Her book, Gutai, Descendering Modernism, received an honorable mention for the Robert Motherwell Book Award. And she's also the curator of the exhibition, award-winning exhibition, Gutai, Splendid Playground at the Guggenheim Museum in New York. 2013. So um, Ming is currently working on two projects, transnational cities and also curatorial, um, curatorial worlding, which considers recent practices of transnational exhibition making. So, uh, and her experience is, you know, just very, very extensive. And um, so I'd like to welcome Ming and pass the mic to her. She's going to talk about Slate School as um, a, a nodal point in this really interesting global transnational network. Me. Thank you, Mia. Thank you, Nikita. And uh, thanks to all of you for being here today. Um, it's wonderful to be part of this floating constellation of different networks and um, friendships that you know, span so many continents. So it's a pleasure and a privilege to be here. Thank you. 
And I just wanted to mention also that I am a, an associate member of ICI Berlin because um, my good friend Christoph Tolze, who's um, the director there, is sitting right here. And, um, I think it's significant um, to, to mention that also as a, a node of connection for um, those of us who are in Berlin. So, um, my paper today is called The Undercommons of Art History, The Slade School of Fine Art and Decolonial Modernism. So it's um, a subset of what I promised I would do in the abstract, but you know, these things happen. Um, so this is uh, an ongoing project that I have um, that I just uh, started about a year ago. Is there a way to uh, reduce the amount of um, echo in this? It seems like there's a... a high chance of feedback. Can you, okay, is that, is that better? Okay, great, thanks. All right. In 1863, these five young Japanese aristocrats, eventually known as the Choshu Five, left Japan legally during the Tokugawa shogunate, sakkoku or seclusion policy, disguised as English soldiers. Um, the five boarded a ship bound for Shanghai where they took refuge on an opium storage ship before dividing into two groups to sail through the Cape of Good Hope to London as anonymous apprentice seamen. Whereas one observer noted they were tasked with, quote, washing decks, working pumps, and spreading sails, as no one was aware of their aristocratic status. Once in London, the five enrolled at the University College London, where they had been sent by Choshu leaders to study Western military technology and practices in an undercover plot to build Choshu's strength, contest foreign aggression, and eventually to overthrow the Tokugawa shogunate. Upon their return to Japan, the Choshu Five took on major leadership roles in the Meiji government and were protagonists in Japan's struggle to repel Western imperialism and colonization. The Choshu Five included Ito Hirobuni, who became the first prime minister, and Inoue Kaoru, who became the secretary of state for foreign affairs. In addition, the group included three figures who were instrumental in modernizing Japan. Endo Kinosuke, who established a unified currency in Japan and founded the Mint, Yamao Yozo, founder of Japan's first institute of technology, and Nomura Yakichi, the founder of the Japanese railways. Under their leadership, the new Meiji government embraced a policy of bunmei kaika, or civilization and enlightenment, appropriating Western knowledge in fields as diverse as engineering, law, medicine, philosophy, and art, in order to rapidly build a modern nation state that could resist the incursions of European and American imperialism and colonialism. Prior to their voyage, the Choshu Five had been exclusionists, supportive of Japan's continued isolation policies. It was, however, during their time abroad, landing in opium-drenched Shanghai and understanding firsthand the terrible power of European imperialism, as well as their, during their studies at the University College London, that they developed their tactics of appropriation as resistance. It is no accident that the Choshu Five studied at the University College London. Founded in 1826, it was the first university in England to admit students from around the world, regardless of race or religion. As a result, it became an important site for the education of students from the colonized world inadvertently becoming an important node in the ecosystem of resistance, solidarity, and decolonization that emerged in Britain, a kind of undercommons of space, of, or space of alternative intersection, as theorized by Fred Moten and Stefano Harney. This paper explores the history of one school within the University College London as a site for understanding the ways in which London and other colonial and imperial metropolises such as Paris, Rome, and New York functioned at the intersection of diasporic and global histories to activate and connect transnational decolonial movements. It looks in particular at the Slade School of Fine Art, established in 1871, almost 50 years after the founding of University College London, as a school which admitted not just students from around the world, regardless of race or religion, but also offered equal opportunities to male and female students. 
It considers the Slade in the years after the Second World War, from 1945 to 1960, with the rise of newly independent and soon to be independent territories that increased the number of students from the decolonizing world to the Slade, making the emergence of a decolonial ethos possible. So I'm just showing you here um, one of the photographs, the yearly photographs that they took of all of the students that were at the Slade, this one from 1957. And you can see here I've enlarged the faces of four key um, people in this um, photograph. Um, Shemza, Ezlahi, Wendy Yao, and also Jamila Zafar. Um, Kim Lim was also in this class and at the Slade at this moment, but she um, was not in this photograph. Significantly, the Slade was also established with a mandate to provide fine art training within the context of a liberal education, so that the pedagogical philosophy of the school was broader than the purely technical training that the Beaux-Arts education would have offered at academies in France. In this environment, in addition to pursuing a curriculum that is centered on figure drawing, students developed critical faculties and received an art historical education, which in many cases enabled them to see the systemic failures of modernism's claims to universality and made the Slade a particularly interesting site of decolonial meaning making. The parallel tracks, friendships, and networks that these students forged against the backdrop of global independence movements created a social, cultural, and intellectual and political environment that nurtured two major decolonial strategies in the post-war period, institution building and decolonial esthesis. Um, Unfortunately, I will only be able to have the time to discuss the decolonial institution building strategies um, in the post-war period today, just because of the amount of time that we have. Um, but I'm seeking to cut across national histories um, by identifying these two strategies, to come to a history of decolonial modernism by comparing them at a site of intersection in order to analyze their structures and their logics, as well as their networks and relationalities. By grounding these comparisons in a global microhistory of the Slade, my analysis engages in what Shumei Shi calls relational comparison that resists the universalizing claims and epistemological Eurocentrism of comparative literature by weaving comparisons out of the threads of historical relationships. Furthermore, by self-consciously resisting center-periphery comparisons where the grounds of comparison are never equal, this project traces what Shumei Shi and Françoise Lyonnais call minor transnationalisms. Is this better? Okay. Even if the site of encounter is metropolitan. These relational comparisons can be done in the condensed context of a shared cultural infrastructure or also in the context of traceable networks, friendships, and common experiences. The point here is to arrive at a history of decolonial mobility that refutes existing narratives about the dissemination of knowledge and culture from center to periphery, argues for tra the transnationality and entanglement of both metropolitan and decolonial art histories, as well as theorizing the visual languages of decolonization produced through these journeys. In the immediate post-war period, Many of the artists who went to the Slade from decolonizing or newly independent ter territories were filled with the ambition of building new institutions for their new nations. Much like the Choshu Five, they came in order to conduct research for the purposes of institution building in their countries of origin. In some cases, artists in this group had already achieved a level of artistic success in their countries of origin before coming to the Slade and in a few cases, visited the Slade as part of a major research initiative to build institutions in their countries of origin. While Ben and Wonmu from Nigeria, Menhat Helmi from Egypt, Tseng Yuho from China, as well as Khalid Iqbal and Jamila Zafar from Pakistan were regular students, Zainul Abidin uh, from East Pakistan and Afandi from Indonesia were both higher level visitors all went on to take on important pedagogical and institutional leadership roles, and many are now recognized as the founding figures of modernisms and their institutions in their countries of origin. Of this group, I will be focusing primarily on two figures who gained 
great prominence as arts administrators and as artists. Ben Nwonmu, uh, from the then British colony of Nigeria, and Zainal Abidin, from the territory then known as East Pakistan, now as Bangladesh. So I'm not going to be reading this quote out loud. Um, if you wish, you can read it. It's, it's quite interesting. Ben and Moonmoo's time in London was a struggle between colonial expectations and decolonial awakenings, beginning in 1944 when he arrived as an already established artist with an exhibition record and reputation in Nigeria. Upon his arrival, on a Shell Petroleum Company British Council scholarship in London, he was informed that he was required to enroll in two semesters of remedial studies in drawing, basic painting, and art history. What art historian Sylvester Ogbeki describes as, quote, a short but concentrated lesson in ideological reorientation. It was also during that time that Enwonu made his first acquaintance with the politics of African nationalism at the West African Student Union, although he distanced himself from them out of fear that he might lose his scholarship. At the Slade, Enwonu was classically trained with courses in drawing, sculpture, painting, human anatomy, and European art history, which he supplemented the year after graduation with a year of postgraduate work on West African ethnography. While in England, Nwonu became Nigeria's most internationally prominent artist, receiving exhibitions and major commissions even while a student. But he battled against the ways in which African art was framed within European discourses, as you can see in this slide. Upon completion of his postgraduate work, Nwonu was, was offered an appointment as the art supervisor in the Information Services Department of the Colonial Office in Nigeria. He eagerly returned in 1948 with a vision to devise a nat national cultural policy for modern Nigerian art and to expand its art education program. Unfortunately for Anwonmu, however, his powers in the Nigerian civil service were severely curtailed by the colonial government, which used him as a figurehead and symbol of benevolent colonial rule without granting him any resources or even an office from which he would have been able to engage in any projects to construct a national culture beyond his own artistic practice. It was in this capacity that in 1958, two years after Nigeria gained provisional independence from Britain, that in one who wrote to Slade principal Sir William Coldstream regarding the Slade's planned role in developing art institutions in Nigeria, inquiring in particular about its partnership with the Nigerian College of Zaria. Imagining that Nwonwu was seeking his advice, um, Coldstream reported, responded that, if there is anything you would like to discuss concerning arts education, I would be very pleased to have a talk. By this point, however, Nwonwu had become involved in the Pan-African Negritude movement around the Présence Africaine group in Paris, even delivering a speech at the 1956 Congress of Black Artists and Writers in which he stated that, quote, I know that when a country is suppressed by another politically, the native traditions of the art of the suppressed begin to die out. Then the artists also begin to lose their individuality and the values of their own artistic freedom. Art under this situation is doomed. What follows is an artistic vacuum that may be prolonged for even a century. By this, of course, I do not mean that no more art can be created by the artists, but much of what they could and did do in the past can be denied them and those who follow them. So basically, it's about a kind of colonization of tradition. No longer having to wear the mask of the colonial subject in 1958, Nwonwu expressed views that had taken seed during his student days in London, where he sought to counter the Slade's Eurocentrism with his study of West African ethnography, only to discover the colonial epistemologies of the discipline. In the intervening years, Nwonwu developed a more sophisticated decolonial language through his studio practice in works such as Anyanwu, which I'm showing you here on the right, uh, but also through his alliances with Pan-Africanists in Paris and the optimism of early decolonization in Nigeria. Four days after Coldstream wrote on September 20th, 1958, with his offer 
to discuss art education, and Wonwu responded. He wrote, There seems to be no particular need for a discussion on this subject. He continued, I am to make recommendations to my government on Nigerian art and culture generally, and want to explore, in accordance with your own scheme, how much the Western system of art education may be helpful in achieving the cultural and artistic rebirth that we are working for. If our art does not express African characteristics, then it can play no significant role in, development as an, in our development as a nation. I am not sure that the entire influence of the Slade School would be a good thing. And one was acerbic response was pointed and a comment on what he saw as far too much Brit British interference into the development of national culture in Nigeria, in particular at the Nigerian college Zaria. It was there that the Zaria Society was formed in 1958, a group that under Uche Ukeke advocated for a natural synthesis of European modernist and African visual vocabularies, seeing Enwonwu's embrace of niritude as a colonial hangover. Enwonwu, on the other hand, saw the Zarianists um, as overly influenced by expatriate European art critics such as the German Jewish Uli Bayer and sought to build decolonial art institutions with pan-African rather than European ties. In 1966, and Wonwu led the official Nigerian delegation to, of the first, uh, sorry, of the 1966 First World Festival of Negro Arts in Dakar, Senegal. And although he left Nigeria during the Ni Nigerian Biafran Civil War, he returned to his government post at the end of it in 1970. In 1971, he was appointed professor of, the fine, arts at the, of fine arts at the University of Ife, the first Nigerian to hold the post, and in 1975, left that job to serve as director and special consultant to the International Secretariat of FESTAC, the second World Festival of Black Arts and Culture, which took place in Lagos in 1977. Whereas Nwonwu experienced the decolonial awakening, his decolonial awakening while a student, Zainal Abidin was already a major figure in the post-independence cultural bureaucracy of East Pakistan when he went to the Slade. As with Nwonwu, Abidin's Slade study was instrumentalized by British narratives, which sought to maintain British leadership over its former colonies through the Commonwealth. Abedin's 1951 to 1952 visit to the Slade chronicled in, was chronicled in Commonwealth Today with this article, Zainal Abedin, Pakistan Artist Studying in London. Here, Abedin is portrayed intently observing artists at work, drawing, painting, printmaking, and teaching. In all of the photos save one, Abedin is depicted in postures of close study and absorption, communicating his tutelage the tutelage he was receiving from his hosts. This impression is underscored by the article, which describes him as being, quote, now in Britain on a cultural tour, and, quote, studying etching in London under the famous New Zealand-born engraver, John Buckland White. Does anybody know who he is? <laughs> Anyways, I'm um, describing Aberdeen as a well-known Pakistan artist, and the principal of the Government Institute of Arts, Dhaka, the article communicates the continued prestige of the British leadership and education, as well as its continued role in the development of the Commonwealth, an organization that, although founded in 1931, was reimagining itself in the wake of post-war independence movements. Significantly, the author neglects to comment on Aberdeen's work reproduced in the article, preferring to frame him as an apprentice rather than as a post-colonial voice, and as one of the founding figures of, the Bengal of Bengali modernism. Indeed, if one looks at the images provided by Aberdeen to the magazine, already a different narrative emerges. In his, in his use of brunch, brush ink methods, uh, rapid brushwork and large expanses of water punctuated by a schematically painted skiff with an defined with an economy of gesture. We see a reference to East Asian ink painting and the idea of Pan-Asianism proposed by Rabindranath Tagore in Santini Ketan, as well as his struggle to create a new language of Bengali modernism. 
In Aberdeen's portrayal of rural scenes, and in particular the bull, we see what Iftikhar Dadi describes as, quote, laboring bodies, as heroic figures who are frequently engaged in struggle. A rebuke of colonial and post-colonial power structures that left East Pakistan impoverished and with little political power. In short, while Aberdeen may have carefully studied the technologies of cultural bureaucracy and higher learning, he self-consciously rejected the ideologies with which they were coded and sought instead to use them to build a decolonial culture and language, one rooted in laboring bodies and folk traditions that both refuted British imperialism as well as Pakistani hegemony. I feel like I'm being interrogated. <laughs> <laughs> There we go, that's great, thank yeah, you. Okay. okay, perfect. As opposed to what the article implies, Aberdeen's time at the Slade was less an apprenticeship and an attempt to gain British patronage, and more a fact-finding mission for the newly independent nation of Pakistan, a point substantiated by the circumstances of his having been sent as the founding principal of the Institute of Fine Arts Dhaka, then the premier arts school in Pakistan by the Pakistani government. Furthermore, his itinerary from the, for the trip, which lasted from 1951 to 1952, included not just Britain, but a UNESCO conference in Venice, as well as France, Spain, and the Middle East. In 1956 to 57, Abedin also traveled abroad on a Rockefeller Foundation-sponsored trip to North America, Mexico, and Japan. And in 1961, he accepted an invitation to the Soviet Union which awarded him with a gold medal. So you can see here that he's sort of spanning both sides of the Cold War. Like in Wonmu, Aberdeen was an influential government advisor and bureaucrat who played a central role in, Pakist in the Pakistani cultural bureaucracy before Bangladesh's independence in 1971, and also in the cultural leadership of Bangladesh afterwards. What is interesting about Wonmu and Aberdeen? is that their stories are not unusual, and one sees parallels with the stories of Shakir Ali, Khalid Iqbal, and Jamila Zafar from Pakistan, and Afandi from Indonesia. Iqbal, who was at the Slade from 1952 to 1954, apparently left Lahore to study at the Slade because there were not enough qualified instructors in the newly independent country. Upon his return, he was invited to set up the Department of Fine Art at Punjab University, and in 1965, moved to the National College of Arts, Lahore, where he later became principal, following fellow alumnus Shakir Ali, who was principal from 1961 to 1973. So there's a real Slade network here. Similarly, upon her return, Jamila Zafar had an important career as an institution builder, establishing departments of visual arts at universities in Lahore, Rawalpindi, and Peshawar. And um, apparently, um, she was also um, in contact with Zainal Abedin, who um, set up the Peshawar um, in, in, Department of Visual Arts with her. Indeed, this pattern that combined metropolitan training and research with decolonial institution building was so common that when Indonesian artist Afandi visited the Slade in 1952, Slade professor William Townsend made the following remarks in his diary. A visit from Mr. Afandi, who is said to be the leading Indonesian artist and his very beautiful daughters. They are on a few months visit. He hopes to return to Jakarta and open an art school. It is difficult to see how he will be helped by seeing the Slade. He has no knowledge of Western traditions, technical methods. He has never even been trained as an artist, though he has been for a couple of years in India at various schools of course, one of which was Shantini Keitan for two years. In Indonesia, there appear to be no teachers, but he believes it is possible now to have an art school. I suppose this is a mystical need that goes with national independence. With its establishment, he, estal he imagines funds, students, and staff will appear, but he thinks of a center physically modest with students working most of the time in the native. What Townsend's remarks capture is the decolonial zeitgeist that was growing at the Slade among students from colonized and formerly colonized nations. 
this mystical need that goes with national independence. Although they may have come for British training, what they developed once they were at the Slade was something entirely different, in conflict with the official curriculum, in the native, and in concert, sometimes in dialogue with other students from other colonized territories. In this way, the Slade functioned as a site for the development of a decolonial modernism that I argue was transnational, even if, when examined from within their own national histories, these modernisms appear nationalist. Although the argument has been made by art historians such as Elizabeth Harney, Iftikhar Dadi, and Salah Hassan that these non-Western modernisms are in fact constituted transnationally and in negotiation with metropolitan modernisms, my study actually pushes these arguments farther, theorizing the minor transnationalisms and undercommons that were made possible by the cosmopolitan ecology of the slate. Thank you.